I'm asking that you would give him a very warm welcome, Ben Fry. Um, terrific. So thanks very much for that introduction. Um, I appreciate you all uh, coming out and the invitation to come uh, down here for the visit. Uh, what I would like to do uh, right now is kind of go through a handful of um, a handful of projects uh, to try and give you a sense of uh, what it is that we do and um, you know the way that we approach it. Uh, what I'm interested in is how do you take data and actually make it understandable. Um, so you hear a lot about you know uh, big data and uh, how much data we have and how much you know we're dealing with and this sort of information overload and things like that. But a lot less about how do we actually understand it and what are ways that we can uh, make it more palatable for people or also what what's the point of the debt in the first place? You know, so are we even asking the right, uh, the right questions of it? And so as a, um, both as a, as a researcher, um, you know, doing my uh, graduate work starting, you know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, all the way through, I've been running a, a studio for the last seven years uh, where we try and put these um, sort of things into practice. Uh, I'd like to show a little bit of, you know, how that, what that space looks like. So typically what, um, what happens when we hear from a client is, uh, you know, some sort of a data set that looks like this. This is from the UN Food and Agricultural Organization. Um, this fascinating table of um, information about uh, food consumption around the uh, world over the last 50 years. And the thing is, you know, buried in that table is this really incredible story about um, changing behaviors and changing uh, diets, both country by country, but also just you know, globally in general. And uh, the National Geographic folks asked us to you know, just uh, look all across that database and be able to tr uh, and try and find something that actually told a, an interesting story out of just that, uh, that data. And so we honed in on this notion of um, consumption habits. Uh, just starting with this, um, this chart here, we're looking at you know, overall averages for um, uh, world uh, food consumption, so 2870 calories in 2011. That uh, started down at about 22, 2300 calories 50 years ago, and we can kind of play that back. And then it's also just broken down based on um, these different uh, subcategories like uh, you know, sugar and fat, uh, meat, produce, grain, etc. cetera. Um, and so we can see the story of, um, well, the world getting fatter. Um, and <laughs> the uh, uh, and in particular, you know, the U.S., um, we're number one, you know, so um, here's our exceptionalism with 37% uh, of our diet um, focused on sugar and fat. Um, but being able to look at that across different, uh, different countries, also just simply seeing how that's changed over the years, you know, so not necessarily um, always the case for the U.S. and something's really, you know, sort of shifted in the last, um, in the last 50 years. And so very quickly we can get a sense of um, these dietary changes and you know, we've gone from you know, what was a, a fairly dry uh, way of looking at the data or um, understanding it to something that um, folks can you know, rapidly get a sense of uh, you know, what this data looks like and um, what are the stories within it. Um, also interesting about when you know, working with data sets is we're always looking for data sets that um, really have a tie to you know, uh, socioeconomic factors that are happening in the ground what's actually happening um, globally and the way that the data actually reflects um, broader trends uh, in terms of uh, people's lives. And so in this case, we're looking at just uh, meat consumption, sort of zooming into that a little bit further. Um, and this is, you know, the gets to the crux of what the National Geographic folks wanted to highlight. Basically, meat consumption up by 106% over the last um, 50 years, that is an unsustainable um, situation as far as the impact of uh, meat, being able to raise, uh, raise animals for meat and the impact that that has on the environment. And so, you know, trying to raise this question of what that looks like. Um, you know, the U.S., we've gone up by 30%, really driven by poultry. So this, you know, chicken in every pot idea is more aspirational than anything else. Um, uh, you know, China, you know, up by 1,440%. You know, this just an astonishing uh, number. Uh, Argentina, we see this sort of boom and bust of their economy over the last uh, 50 years as they've dealt with various um, internal upheavals. Um, you know, Kuwait, so here's this, 
incredible image of the invasion of, uh, so during the uh, first Iraq war, the invasion of Kuwait. So, um, and just the enormous impact that that had in terms of, uh, you know, food and diet. Um, here's uh, Libya in terms of their participation or lack thereof within the, the overall uh, world community. And as we're putting all of these together, um, in this, on the left-hand side there, you also see uh, some information about, you know, just what, uh, you know, the things that I'm telling you kind of in this voiceover, but, um, you know, really trying to tease out what's, what's happening there visually. And so um, one of the things that we find is actually that a lot of understanding data or a lot of, da you know, what is supposedly data visualization uh, is really writing. And so how do you actually um, tell stories uh, both visually but then also be able to support that by um, speaking clearly about um, the way that these, uh, what folks are actually seeing within the data set. Um, the other thing that we get excited about is this idea of by making this visual, how do we actually expand the audience of people who would be um, looking at it? And so, um, you know, so for this particular piece, you know, instead of it simply being, um, you know, folks who are uh, familiar with, uh, you know, statistics going to the UN Food and Agricultural Organization site, uh, instead here's, you know, Michael Pollan, who's, you know, one of these food writers and um, out there and uh, bringing his fans into it. And so he's, you know, he's, he's sharing it out. Um, I was even more proud we got uh, MC Hammer. So um, MC Hammer is excited about it. And also, like, so, you know, what the world eats, hashtag data science. So, you know, so here we have a um, 90s pop star who's fired up about data and how data works and, um, you know, sort of what's happening within this. And so it, it uh, you know, the, the more serious point of that, I think it really speaks to the fact that people are actually thinking about this set of issues. You know, it's a really, um, you know, for me personally, having started doing graduate work in this a long time ago and was doing a lot of, uh, you know, initially I was spending time explaining, you know, this data thing, it's kind of coming, it's, uh, you know, there are solutions for it, it's around data visualization, it's about how you understand data, all the way through now where people are actually talking about things like big data and data science and, you know, asking for visualization by name, which is a real shift in, over the last um, 10 and 15 years. Um, you know, so, so many of these uh, pieces come with, you know, very simple, uh, you know, kind of mundane data sets. I was curious uh, once several years ago about how the, um, uh, the postal system works, you know. So I uh, was living in Massachusetts. Uh, everything there starts with zero. Um, I grew up in Michigan, everything, uh, all the postal codes there start with a four. Um, I had just moved from California where everything starts with a nine and being a genius, I thought there might be a pattern. And so um, I wanted to see what that actually looked like. And so I um, started with this table of um, 40,000 postal codes and then built this um, interactive piece that helps me start uh, understanding the way that that works. So here's uh, every postal code done as a single point. Here are all the zeros. Here's all the ones, the twos, the threes, the fours, the fives, all the way through the nines. And so, you know, again, we've taken this very mundane data set and asked a very simple question of it, like what is the, um, you know, what do all the ones look like? What do all the zeros look like? How can I actually start um, putting a picture around this and use, use this design or use this visualization as, or this interactive piece as a way of actually understanding what's in the data set. So how do I learn about you know, this set of information? Um, to make it a little bit more interesting, we can also just you know, be able to zoom into those different areas. So here's zero, two, now we're looking at Eastern Massachusetts, one and three and uh, nine with Cambridge. Um, what is, it starts, what's the code here? It's one, uh-oh. I should have written this down beforehand, one, nine? One one nine. Nine. Three. You have several right in one spot. Here we are, East Hampton. Very good. Um, and so how do we, you know, simply uh, be able to unpack this, you know, very simple data set and put it together in an interactive graphic um, that helps people understand what's, you know, what's in there or what the, the overall structure of it is. I think one of the other, um, let's see and then it freezes up on me. Let me try that once more. Uh, 
Um, also, having done this uh, and have this actually, having this actually up and running in software, I can do things like, well, let's not look at zip codes, let's look at uh, names. So here are all the Springfields. We have a lot of Springfields uh, in the US. Um, but also trends like, you know, here's all of the, uh, the cities starting with sand. So essentially the um, influence of uh, Spanish language coming up through the, um, the Southwest. Um, if we look at, uh, you know, sometimes we can see other uh, migration patterns and such as, uh, as folks have moved across, let's see, um, moved across the, uh, the US themselves. And so again, being able to just, you know, now that we've, um, we have this data up and running and that we can look at it, um, being able to very quickly switch over to other kinds of questions based on, on what we've found. Uh, doing this at a slightly larger scale, um, uh, Darwin's Origin of Species, uh, a friend of mine a couple years was telling me about how uh, Origin of Species actually changed a great deal over the course of Darwin's uh, lifetime. So the, the very first edition he put out was about 150,000 words. Um, six editions later, 14 years later, uh, it had grown to 190,000 words. And so, um, and also there was this guy, Wallace, that um, kind of came up with the same ideas, um, or sort of parallel ideas at the same time. And I was like, wow, you know, was Darwin kind of, um, you know, cribbing off of Wallace's notes? And, you know, what does that actually look like? But at the end of the day, what were, uh, you know, 150,000 words through up to 190, uh, we're talking about a million words of text. And so what does that even look like? And so um, to start getting into that, um, uh, I built this uh, interactive piece that shows us all six editions, um, you know, so the first uh, done in 1859 is in this first column, and then on through the sixth edition in the right-hand side. And uh, as I uh, drag the mouse here, I can, um, you know, have each of the columns actually synchronized based on, you know, looking at the same sentence across all of the editions. Um, and then I can zoom in and actually see what the nature of the changes are. So here's kind of, you know, Darwin plus track changes. Like Darwin's like fighting through Microsoft Word and like this is, um, you know, like keeps crashing on him and he's trying, trying to get this book out. Um, and so what this helps us do is get a sense of, you know, what are the nature of the changes that he put in? You know, so sometimes it's rewriting something for clarity. Other times it's um, really reinforcing a point or, um, you know, strengthening a particular point. Uh, or in other cases, he's actually adding completely new ideas. You know, this, um, this idea of survival of the fittest didn't show up until uh, the fifth edition. And we actually attribute that um, to Darwin and even refer to his theory as being about survival of the fittest, but it came from Herbert Spencer. It wasn't until a decade of the uh, book being in existence that it, um, that it actually showed up. And so, you know, I think you talk to, uh, so this idea of like just being able to see what a, sci like a, a scientist sort of struggling through this idea I think is really fascinating. Um, I think especially for folks outside of science, what you tend to think of is, you know, something like, um, you know, the theory of evolution or other sort of uh, scientific principles that are more or less accepted as fact um, as being things that, you know, sort of were inscribed on clay tablets, you know, like Darwin came down from the hill and he had this all figured out. But if you talk to any scientist, what, you know, their entire life is this thing of, I just found this thing out. And it just introduces 10 more questions that I don't understand about, you know, like, and so being able to see them struggling through these different uh, notions within the book, I found really um, very fascinating. So, um, so that was the initial version. Uh, in the course of doing that, I found out somebody else had actually done this, except he had done it 50 years earlier. Um, by painstakingly going through the six editions with index cards and uh, constructing this text. So this is my, this is my 800 page um, competition. Uh, again, the, the thing about, uh, you know, that I think is exciting about this work is how do you, instead of this being something that's the domain of Darwin scholars, how can you actually introduce this idea to other, uh, other groups of people who didn't necessarily wake up thinking, you know, I'd really like to know how the origin of species change over the course of you know, the, um, 14 years. Um, and uh, a later version of this piece was done for, a, for an installation. So um, how do we actually explain, you know, show this in a more general way on a um, large touch screen, um, you know, for people who want to just get some sense of, you know, what's, what's happening in the book and be able to tell this story. And so um, here's the entire book. 
Uh, and then over time, we're just adding all of the changes for the second edition and the third and the fourth and so on. Um, I'm sort of fast forwarding it through here. But, um, and you see things like, you know, in this very last paragraph, um, you know, Darwin adds this extra reference to God during the, um, in the second edition, edition of the text, sort of, you know, somewhat wary about, uh, you know, still somewhat wary about where God fit in terms of this overall uh, theory and perhaps, you know, if he's taking on the scientific establishment, maybe not totally directly take on the religious establishment at the same time. Um, and so we can see how this, uh, how this plays out over time. Um, with this, uh, you know, having done that piece, then uh, here's a, a poster version of it. So this is done with a, you know, three-point type. So we have the entire text of the book um, all in just one glance. Um, or if the, your eyesight's not that good, um, just done as a book and be able to see, you know, sort of where, uh, what was the point of origin for, you know, any given, um, you know, line or phrase from that, uh, from that book. Uh, as far as how these things are built, so the other, um, another part of the work that I do is really how do we get more people involved in and in, um, creating this kind of work. And so to that end, uh, about 15 years ago, my friend uh, Casey and I started this project called Processing. Um, at the time, we were at MIT, and a big part of the group that we were in was this, uh, the pedagogical side of, you know, it's not that interesting to have a handful of guys at MIT who are doing this art and design and code and engineering thing, but rather it gets a lot more interesting when you bring in people from outside of those domains. And so to that end, we uh, created this processing project, which was about uh, a very simple programming environment to get people up and running. Um, you know, so the idea is be able to write a couple lines of code, hit run, and um, see something to show up, uh, show up on screen. Um, we have this mission statement, you know, so after 10 years, uh, we finally wrote a mission statement. So processing project seeks to ruin the careers of talented designers by tempting them away from their usual tools into the world of programming and computation. Similarly, the project is designed to turn engineers and computer scientists to less gainful employment as artists and designers. Um, and, and we've actually had some success with this, and so it's an enormous point of pride for me as far as um, kind of ruining people's careers and breaking them and um, you know, making artists geekier and making engineers um, be more, you know, turn into artists. Um, and the project has just continued to grow over time. This is the number of people per month. So we're up at about a quarter million people per month sort of um, playing with the software. That's really exciting as far as just um, the idea of getting more folks engaged with, uh, with code. Um, and over time, this has also begun to break out into other kinds of projects. So we started with uh, this desktop version of the software that was uh, focused on the, uh, the Java programming language for uh, folks familiar with that. Um, more recently, we funded some work to kick off this P5.js project, which is kind of, you know, if we started the project today and really designed it around today's web, what would it look like? How would you build things uh, for the web using that? Um, we also have, you know, a, a Python mode, which uh, folks use for, uh, for teaching, because Python's a really lovely um, teaching language. Um, we've also ported it to things like the, the Raspberry Pi. So here we have this $25 computer um, that can run these kinds of, uh, you know, this type of software. So, um, you know, even something like the Darwin piece, running that on this, you know, this tiny device really opens up a lot of interesting avenues. Um, or being able to do that with mobile devices. So here uh, we have a version where you can take the same code and hit run, and instead of showing up on your screen, it's going to um, show up on your uh, Android mobile device and uh, be able to build applications that way. And so, again, just trying to, you know, simple or like a trying to simplify or um, really shorten that path between you know, writing a little bit of code and actually um, having something running and performant. Um, switching, over, switching over to the teaching side of things, uh, this past spring um, I returned to uh, MIT as a, as a lecturer um, teaching a course in information design and basically saying, you know, can, how can we um, put some of these ideas together and uh, teach a course around it? Um, these are some of my wonderful TAs, so uh, Ege, who is in the architecture department, and James, who are, who's our head of design, and Leslie, who's one of our lead uh, engineers back at um, Fathom. Um, James provides all the enthusiasm for us. Um, and as far as the, the kinds of things that we did with them, you know, so first we started with um, this clock project, so you know, being able to 
Um, clocks are nice because it's a, a way of, you know, you're mapping a set of numbers, you know, hours and minutes and seconds into some sort of a visual form, and you can be as literal, as abstract as you like to, and so it makes a nice um, starting point to get people thinking about, one, the simple, you know, algebra of how you map from one set of numbers to another, um, but two, you know, what are you doing visually with it, and, um, you know, how do people look at it and make it understandable for them. Uh, we then moved into uh, doing things around the weather, and so like the weather being this uh, a dynamic data set that's fairly easy to um, connect to, and then be able to you know you can do things around uh, time series or what's you know happening instantaneously, and then we also made them uh, run on their mobile phones, you know, so everything from this very literal representation showing you know the up and down of the temperature to this one where um, it's modeling the uh, wind on a vector field, and then you're dragging a boat around, and it's blowing around based on uh, the wind direction. Um, or other, you know, sort of uh, versions that are a little bit somewhere in between. Um, this one, the, the kid threw, like, the kitchen sink at it. It's like every single little detail he could get about the weather and kind of built it into this um, sort of oracle for himself. Um, after that, we moved into a, a project on census data, so the Census um, Bureau has some APIs to make it easier to um, you know, get access to their data, and so we gave them sort of an open call to you know, uh, dig through that and uh, try and find an interesting story to tell. Um, and then finally, we uh, you know, let them spend the last couple weeks with um, a uh, you know, choose your own adventure, kind of you know, pick, a, pick a project that you find is interesting and pursue that. And so it was everything from you know, looking at uh, colors on mo uh, movie posters to uh, modeling contamination outbreaks and food supply networks uh, to looking at impact of various figures in the news uh, to a, a day calendar of uh, what city on that day had the worst air pollution. Um, you know, sort of like a cheerful, like, oh, today, here we go, Monday. <laughs> it's Monday, Campbell City, or Campbell County, Wyoming is not doing well. Um, uh, another, you know, uh, positive one, these are the sur uh, survivors and people who uh, died in the Titanic. Um, this one is a, uh, a fairly nice one looking at um, all of the peaks in Switzerland, all of the mountain peaks, and uh, colored based on the, uh, their name. So that, uh, within Switzerland, you have these four languages that are spoken. So uh, German, Italian, French, and Romanche. Uh, Romanish, and uh, so, to, so looking at the number of speakers versus the number of peaks that were uh, named in each of those languages, and also be able to map out kind of where those, uh, where those sit. And so sort of a fascinating look at, um, you know, both the history and the naming, but also, the, you know, region by region, uh, you know, what are the languages spoken there, and also what have uh, traditionally, what, uh, what's the, um, uh, what has been the language uh, spoken there in the past. So um, a fun set of, uh, you know, we were, we were pleased with sort of the range of things that people were, uh, were thinking about and pursuing. All right, so, and I'd like to um, wrap with two um, sort of larger, uh, larger projects in terms of these, and that uh, we think about them as these kind of platforms, you know, so a lot of times within uh, data visualization works, there's this, uh, this idea of, um, I'm gonna take this data set, I'm gonna make this graphic, it's gonna sit on a web page somewhere, or it, it's kind of a, a thing unto itself. But instead, um, more important is all of these issues around, given, the, given a data set that you are trying to look at, how do you map that to different kinds of audiences and different kinds of contexts in which they'll be using it? You know, so if it, is it something that's going to, uh, um, you know, set of 20 and 30 year olds? Is it going to executives who are, you know, taking a glance at it on their mobile phone? Um, is it a dashboard that's being used by an internal audience? Um, I've spent a lot of time working, say, with scientists, and so the, the graphics that I would create for a uh, domain expert is, you know, going to be very different from uh, doing this, even using the same data set for a uh, magazine publication. And so this, uh, this project here we did with the uh, Clinton Foundation and Gates Foundation um, around uh, understanding the uh, changes in terms of progress for women and girls over the last 20 years. And what they wanted to do is say, you know, how much data can we collect from uh, 
1995 through 2015 to be, and be able to see what, um, what those changes look like. And so the, uh, the result is this uh, noceilings.org um, site that we created um, has a number of different, uh, different stories looking at different pieces of this data uh, or you know, sometimes these uh, interactive pieces. This is looking at uh, the gender gap and workforce participation and so being able to play that back over uh, 15 or 20 years. And this is just country by country, you know, so um, within, uh, within different countries, you know, so uh, in Japan, 73% of men uh, were in the labor workforce in um, uh, 2005, but only 48% of women. And um, we can, if we actually sort this by women, um, we can actually see, you know, there's some amount of uh, contraction with this in terms of you know, we're getting to greater parity, but um, it's still, there's a uh, great deal of work to be done, but also um, simply getting a sense of what this, even, what this even looks like or how it's changed over the years. Um, so that's one, uh, one such example, but separate from the interactive pieces, we're looking at, you know, how do you separate between, you know, a full interactive thing like that that might be on a, a large scale installation to these smaller bumper sticker things that you know, belong on Facebook or Twitter. And so uh, we pulled out a couple of you know, points like this where, you know, so here's uh, the US is one of nine countries worldwide that doesn't provide paid maternity leave. You know, it's basically us and a bunch of island nations. Um, it's just a little bit embarrassing. Um, and it's you know, like it, you, can't, uh, you think this can't possibly be true. And so as a result, we have this very prominent about the data uh, every single time and uh, spend a lot of time providing context around it and also as many layers as possible to let people really dig into what, uh, what's happening in that data. Um, 200 million fewer women have internet access in the, than men in the developing world. So you think about what uh, internet access means in terms of economic participation and you can see how that is a problem that um, you know, really cascades and uh, is, uh, yeah, just simply is a, uh, growing and getting worse. Um, one in three women suffers physical or uh, sexual violence. You know, so again, this idea of where does that stat come from? You know, that I, th I think there's a tendency to um, put out various stats. Uh, these, the stats are often put out by organizations who have a specific thing that they're trying to prove. Um, instead, we also always want to be able to point people back to the original data sources and let them go as deeply into that as, uh, as possible um, so that they can, you know, think about it and make decisions for themselves. Um, so those, you know, function well as far as uh, folks, you know, sharing them on Twitter um, and other social platforms. Um, you know, we've got, at the end of the day, 850,000 data points that went into this. Um, and that's across 978 different indicators and about 190 countries and then 20 years. And so just an astonishing amount of information, but how do we instead um, uh, craft that for different kinds of audiences? And so uh, here we've got... Um, this is where we started, so it's you know, a spreadsheet of about a quarter million rows, uh, and they said, you know, find some stories. And so, uh, so we did. So there are uh, different themes you know, so in that spreadsheet. They're broken down by particular themes, uh, indicators like you know, uh, reading tests or, uh, spe at specific levels, and then you know, each of the countries. And so um, you know, and this balance between how, much, or how filled in the various data points are versus the stories that they want to tell um, versus how, um, how easily we can explain the, um, the topic is, you know, were things that fit into decisions about what we would actually um, share with any of these. Uh, given that spreadsheet, we built this tool, which um, just let us look at all of the data. So we wanted as many people as possible, you know, not just people who are data analysts or engineers or something like that, but for them to be able to um, look at that uh, data set and start figuring out you know, where, where do we have enough data to tell uh, an interesting story? What, what are different points on which we actually have an interesting, uh, interesting story? And so this is not as you know, refined in terms of design as what we would do for something that's, that we're actually posting, but instead, how do we uh, use this to get a quick look at the data? Um, also just you know, one of the things when uh, dealing with large data sets is how, what, are the, what are the gaps like? You know, so where do we really, where are we really missing portions of the, uh, of the, of the data? And so um, this is just a, you know, every single indicator and then uh, the brightness or the, the grayscale value at the right-hand side is just 
how filled in that particular data point is. Um, and so that would give us an overall picture of like, you know, we have a lot of good data within education, but less so in terms of economic participation or something like that. Um, and then uh, Alec, uh, Alex, Alexander Geller, who is our um, sort of lead analyst on this, uh, she then started pulling out different stories to say, you know, here's where we're starting to see trends in the data. And so just do very simple um, bar charts and things to get a sense of, you know, to try and kind of pitch this story and say, does this match up with the, the things that the uh, Clinton and Gates Foundations wanted to actually talk about or that were topics of the, uh, of the time that they wanted to highlight? Um, and, you know, having found something, we would then go back to the original sources. Um, a lot of cheerful reporting from uh, the UN and the World Bank and so on. Um, and then also figuring out, you know, so for these different stories, what, what level do these live at? You know, so we had these um, things that we called the, the birds in the nest in the basement. So sort of our internal naming, but um, the birds was really about here are these small uh, things that are going to be shared by social uh, platforms and we intend for people to look at, you know, they, they sort of go out and they live on their own. Um, the nest is the, you know, the site itself that we want to get people in there to, um, you know, really uh, dig around and look at different kinds of things. And then finally, the, um, the basement, I mean, it's, it's a finished basement, um, but that's really a, a refined version of that map, you know, so at that point you can get access to all 850,000 data points. You can always get back to every last source. Um, and for people who are, you know, uh, oriented around policy, um, they can get every last detail on each of these, uh, each of these data points. And so uh, making, making it work across all these different audiences uh, and within different contexts, whether, you know, it's somebody sitting on their desktop machine at, at work or it's somebody reading Facebook and clicking out to a mobile thing on their phone, um, we want all of these to kind of play nicely together. Um, Let's see. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we did also different versions of this as far as, you know, here's a, a 3D globe version that's a very simplified version of the map um, running on your phone. You know, you can do really amazing things with uh, enormous amounts of data just on our, our phones these days. Um, but also, it's not a matter of just the most, uh, uh, you know, most striking, most technologically advanced, you know, sort of image like a, you know, OpenGL thing are happening on a phone, but rather, um, this is probably one of my favorites as far as, um, and by favorites I mean just really sad and um, frustrating, but uh, this is looking at PISA math scores, so this is, uh, you know, women in uh, fifth and sixth grade, and their um, scores, um, uh, men versus women, and then the uh, dissimilar pathways, so uh, basically the enormous gap between, in spite of, um, you know, how even this is, the uh, career choice and the direction that people take um, later in life is so drastically different. And this isn't, you know, and that's not a matter of like 10 or 20% different or um, something like that, but it's just really very, very striking. And so um, this is sort of an unmistakable um, point that hopefully serves as a point of discussion. Uh, and then we put all the data up online. So having gone through that spreadsheet, we uh, put all the data up online to uh, make it more accessible and get people to, to use it. Um, so that's it, uh, noceilings.org. I, I encourage you to check that, uh, check that out. Um, and uh, I'll just quickly um, cover this last piece. This is a, um, a project that we did for Thomson Reuters called uh, Connected China. Um, it's, a, it's a look at uh, power in China and how it um, how it works, uh, they were looking at the once in a decade leadership transition at the, head of the, at the top of the Communist Party and wanted a way to explain this to a larger audience. And so um, we put together this application that took um, you know, a quarter million of words of text that they had assembled, tens of thousands of relationships and connections between individuals, um, and it was broken into these different groups, so the, uh, or different sort of subparts of the application. Um, this is the uh, sort of the social network, so the, um, you know, looking at the connections between individuals, and so at how do we um, see how influence works there. So here's President Xi Jinping and his first degree of, of connect, you know, all his Facebook friends. Um, and so, and what's the first degree of connections for him? Uh, this view is the institutional view. It's looking at, on paper, what are the interactions between these 
uh, people supposed to look like? You know, what is the actual hierarchy um, or org chart um, on paper for how they interact with one another? Um, again, being able to look, uh, you know, go deeper and deeper into the, um, into the story as far as people want to. Um, here, looking at the arc of individual uh, careers, and you know, because there are actual levels to um, you know, uh, positions within the Communist Party that we can literally map the arc of uh, someone's career as they're uh, promoted through uh, different parts of uh, the government. Um, so that's, uh, that is just a quick wrap up of that. Um, and I will, uh, I will close there. So, thanks. <laughs> So we have, a few, we have a little bit of time for questions and answers, so uh, ask away. Yes, Matthew. Uh, that was a very interesting. It's always interesting to see um, how technology can actually demonstrate um, information. So one of the things that we, that we really talk about with the students is how to be critical about the information that they're looking at, yes. particularly the data that they're looking at. So could you just talk a little bit about how impressive looking information is and how you still have to be critical about what you're looking at and, and how you can analyze that information. Yeah, so it's something we spend uh, a lot of time on as far as um, making sure that, like, we, we do a lot of gut checks, you know, so around the studio we do a lot of gut checks to basically say, are, are we responding to this image because uh, it's striking visually or are we responding because of what's, what the actual content behind it is? Um, and that's also not, to, so, it's an example of where um, the, uh, you know, so I showed the bar chart in terms of the education versus um, career choice. Um, so that's something that, uh, even with something as straightforward as a, as a bar chart, you still, uh, you can still get the point. Um, in other cases, if we, uh, there's also a, a, a balance to be made as far as how do you, how do you engage people um, with the information? And so, uh, we want to have things look uh, look interesting enough, look striking enough. The, um, uh, for instance, the uh, National Geographic piece, doing that as this sort of you know uh, pie chart kind of thing that um, the UN stats folks uh, you know would probably prefer it to be a bar chart. You know, but it's like, but actually people kind of like stuff that's round, and it's like you know it looks um, it looks a little bit more interesting, and as something that's being done for an audience of you know like a broader audience. It makes sense to use that. It makes sense to use this sort of, uh, you know, brighter color palette than we might use for um, an internal tool. Um, it makes sense to have these different kinds of animations and things like that. But um, as far as the, uh, you know, at the end of the day, though, that the truth is is the paramount thing, and we try and spend a lot of time uh, working out the story without actually doing the finishing on it. You know, so I briefly showed with the uh, the no ceilings work. Um, you know, these sort of bar chart versions uh, of the uh, PDF that Alex had put together to say, here's the story, here are the things that we're starting to see in the data. And so before we put a more refined design around it, we know that that story actually works as a core sort of thing. And I think, um, I think one of the problematic things about a lot of the work within, you know, sort of the data visualization space, or data viz, um, is that the, uh, an enormous number of the pieces that you see are really, what you're responding to is really the, the, um, the visual and the way that it's presented and not the, the content of what's there. Or there's sort of some balance between like, oh, it's really beautiful, but I actually think it's really scary if, you, if folks say, like the, one of the worst bits of feedback I can get is, oh, it's so beautiful, but I, you know, I don't understand it. Or like like they, <laughs> if, they, if it's beautiful, but it actually causes them to shut off their brain to be thinking about what's there, it's like, I've completely missed it, you know? And so, um, because what, you know, at the end of the day, what I wanna be doing is uh, creating something that's the, if it's, you know, to the degree that it's striking or beautiful or whatever you wanna call it, um, that is something that serves as a, a way to pique their curiosity into uh, digging further into it. And I'm not even so much concerned with trying to convince people of my point, but I want to engage them on that point more than anything else. And so um, I guess it's a long way of saying we, we spend a lot of time thinking about it. Heather. Uh, 
Hi, thank you. This has been really interesting. Um, I teach math, mm -hmm. and I think most people would agree the trend in math education is that graphical analysis mm -hmm. is probably one of the most important skills that students can graduate with at this point, for the layman even, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about any participation in, with high schools in this or any like particular project that's been successful with high school students mm -hmm. or, thank you. We've, we've had some, uh, some high schools um, uh, using, using processing and building, uh, building things with it. Um, we've, I'm trying to think of the, uh, there's a uh, girls school in New York that um, uh, one of my favorite talks was um, going in and speaking to them and that they had been using it as part of their uh, computer science curriculum. And one of the things that they were excited about was the idea of this, um, you know, so for, uh, I'm really interested in how do we reach people that um, are immediately turned off from programming because they say like, I'm not a math person or like they're, they're not interested in computer science because they're like, well, computer science is all math. And it's like, well, it's not really, it's not really all math. It's uh, the thing that you actually have to get over with computer science is more the, the sequencing of things and how do you give the computer instructions and all that. Um, but within the, uh, within the math space, I think one of the things that's really interesting is um, it bringing in a different set of, uh, so being able to do some of these things visually uh, will sometimes uh, engage folks in a different way than um, those who hadn't, uh, who hadn't necessarily been drawn to it. Um, I, you know, personally, I was not a fan of, of trig until my first, uh, sem first semester of grad school and I did nothing but, you know, trig as I learned to kind of build all of these, um, you know, sort of things like this. Um, in a similar fashion, I think, uh, you know, just uh, how do you, yeah, I mean, it's really just about uh, giving people a different, uh, different road into this, um, into that space. So. Question? I have a question. Yeah. Wait, you have a question? No, no. Please. So the Darwin um, section um, brought up a lot of work that was being done in the 90s and the zeros of the Folger on Shakespeare. Mm. And I'm wondering if um, there's some folio projects or if anyone like Stephen Greenblatt or others have approached one to make their life easier because <laughs> these projects take many years, mm -hmm. but also um, the broader implications for literary studies in terms of integrated English. So that's bringing data, big data, into literary studies. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what the history is with, it, with other literary organizations um, and if there's um, possibility of that happening, if it's not happening. Mm -hmm. it, uh, I haven't been able to do much with it um, as yet. We were. Um, uh, we've had different groups uh, reach out at various times that, you know, there's a whole domain of digital humanities, obviously, that um, a lot of folks are really, um, you know, putting a lot of energy into. Um, I, I actually see the, the Darwin um, piece as it stands now is actually a fairly simple version of that, that kind of thing, you know, that, um, uh, you know, at the, at the risk of, like, completely undermining it for you. I think the... Um, the real version of that would be, uh, you know, those words didn't show up the first time in 150,000 word form, right? And so what I really want to see is his uh, two decades plus of writing and sketchbooks and when he wrote, you know, these various notes in, his, in the um, uh, sidebar and things like that. And I want to see how all of that fits into the, the final piece. And so, um, you know, to some degree, What's seen there is a little bit of a shortcut to that, but I think to really get, um, get into some of those, I think it's a much more com uh, much more compelling would be uh, just uh, even far, the far less structured uh, sets of data that all kind of feed into this, and that there we're really getting much closer to his thought process and the way that things are kind of um, you know make, working its way through through his head and yeah. Can I ask my question now? <laughs> Wait, who's that? Sam? Sam. Hi, thank you. Um, can we use Gapminder in our classroom, or would you recommend another tool to do data visualization for students, let's say, in their ability to comprehend mm -hmm. essay writing? Or, yeah. yep. uh, I mean, I, I think I'm a, 
I'm a big fan of just of using the the best you know best possible tool for the, tool for the job. You know, so the um, gap miner stuff is really is terrific as far as um, if I want to see something that's uh, uh, a set of points on across two axes and that and how that's changing over time. Um, Gapminder is a really fantastic tool, you know, for that for that kind of story. Um, and as, but as, as soon as you get outside of that kind of story, then there are others that you might uh, might want to pursue, or um, you know, even before going the full custom route and sort of you know coding things yourself, that there are various other other tools out there that um, can help along with that. Gary. Yeah. Hi, I teach AP Statistics, so this is fun times for me. Um, we talk a lot about in my classroom about ethics and bias and how to maintain a valid data set and how to look at what you're seeing and not making the story before this, it produces itself. Uh, how do you go about making sure that when you do that with your, whoever you're working with, your quarter of a million people, that, yep. that they're doing that? Yep. So the, um, I think of it a lot in terms of, or like I find it really helpful to think about it in terms of writing, and that there are different, uh, so the same way that uh, if I'm writing a story, it's a, you know, and it's a thousand word um, article or something like that, I have this uh, enormous set of you know, facts, ideas, opinions, quotes, et cetera, that I need to digest down to, into this you know, thousand word piece. And, um, the, uh, the way of thinking about it then too is, well, is it 1,000 words, is it 500 words, is it actually a, um, an academic history of this space? You know, depending on that context, um, that tells you a lot about sort of the level of detail and the, um, you know, do we put error bars on it? Do we, um, when is it, does it make sense to actually uh, not include certain pieces of the data um, for, to increase clarity? So the, say the National Geographic piece, we chose a selection of countries uh, in order to, um, well, one, that we didn't have uh, the full uh, 100, you know, 190 or 200 uh, countries, so we couldn't cover that. Um, we were focused on storytelling, so we chose to leave out um, uh, countries that were you know, sort of directly, directly adjacent and had really very similar patterns, um, since it wasn't that informative. Um, but basically, we're making a, a dozens or even hundreds of decisions of like, uh, like that, but again, it has to go to the, you know, we can, we can never sacrifice on the, you know, the truth of what's in the data, um, and then we have to balance that against what's appropriate for that setting, you know, and I think one of the um, problems that happens within the visualization space, too, is that there's a, there's a belief about um, sort of there's a right way of, you know, showing any particular data set, and it's really, there's a right way sh uh, for a particular audience in a particular context of use, and, um, and that's the lens through which we wanna, uh, we wanna do things. But uh, enormously important to be sensitive about it and thinking about it, and it's a huge focus. Just a follow-up uh, follow question. Do you have like a list, a documentation of like what the rules are for those specific things that, yep. like if I wanted to share it with kids, like this is how Real adults do it to make sure non-bias. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The um, we don't have a uh, you know that's a it's a great uh, idea. We should actually um, we should actually enumerate that as as something that we do internally because right now for uh, for us I mean we're a you know uh, twelve or fifteen person studio and so there's sort of uh, that's transmitted right now through culture and uh, um, feedback and. Um, you know that there's there's so many rounds of uh, iteration and feedback on any given project that that tra uh, translates um, that doesn't necessarily scale and so it would would actually be a good idea to say you know really um, kind of go through those different uh, different pieces of we will you know we will not compromise on this or um, you know and even uh, be able to do that or, uh, for clients and be able mm -hmm. to uh, list some of that out for them. I was just wondering, um, I'm assuming you don't do the data collection, your, your company just does the visualization. So how do depends. you, um, depends, yeah. how do you ensure that the data you're receiving is at your job, uh -huh. that the data itself has accuracy and isn't just yeah. being spun the way they want it yeah, to? Yeah, so that's actually one of the, 
Um, that's, uh, that's a really tricky, so it's a great question. And it's, um, and it's actually very tricky because uh, in some cases we are doing uh, the data collection and we have some control over that process and we also know about uh, where the data has come from and that kind of thing. Uh, the part where it actually becomes problematic is when, if we're not doing the data collection and as we start to visualize it, we can very, very, very quickly see issues with the data collection. You know, so like there's nothing to tell you problems about your, the veracity of the data or the um, errors in collection and things like that than seeing a picture of it. And you would be astonished to, um, to see the degree to which um, people who, uh, I mean, we had a, uh, I can't, I shouldn't name names, but um, <laughs> uh, a company that we worked with, and they had a comp uh, another company who worked for them as the um, st you know, statistical database monks that were in charge of this uh, enormous data set for them. Um, and they had never, uh, we started building uh, things that actually showed you know, some of the aspects of what was in the data. And uh, we very quickly saw uh, well, so one, they had never seen it that way, and it was actually very surprising for them that, oh, we actually didn't know we had uh, more when, men than women in this database, and it was like a 60 to 40% uh, breakdown, and, and that in a data set that shouldn't actually really have much difference between the two. Um, so even it's something as simple as a fact like that, uh, not necessarily present, um, but also as we start seeing some of those issues, we're still on the hook to deliver something, and so we need to figure out how to um, how can we tell a story that actually uses a set of the data that we're actually comfortable with and that we know that the, um, the, uh, there's enough you know, truth to it and that it actually uh, matches up properly because um, otherwise we're you know, uh, kind of repeating the error you know, back to other people and, um, and especially because those things show up as you know, huge outliers and you can say some really striking things but they'd be incorrect. You know? so, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a, a huge thing for us, and um, even on the, the No Ceilings work that um, there was another, another group that was assembling everything and putting it into that spreadsheet, um, we didn't trust that spreadsheet that had been given to us, and so uh, for each of these stories, which is uh, a, couple dozen, uh, a couple dozen different threads that we looked at, um, we actually went back and double checked with the sources. Anytime we saw kind of an outlier or something like that, we checked the source and also we checked previous years and things like that to see if um, there was an error in, in data collection that year. You know, so um, you know, a, a, maybe a short version of that is also kind of like, this is one of the fallacies about the d big data thing that really doesn't get enough attention. Yeah. You know, like, that's great, you collected um, 10 trillion data points and guess what, it's a mess. <laughs> You know, like it. Um, They're all wrong. Yeah, yeah. That reminds me of my question, <laughs> which I'm going to ask now. This is going to be a good one. I'm excited about this. <laughs> We've been no, no. First Here. of all, I want to ask, and I think I know the answer, but you said something at the beginning of your talk. You said when you were younger, um, and and at, I guess at MIT, and you said you said to your peers, your colleagues. This data thing is coming. We got to be ready, right? So, what did you mean by this data thing when you said so, that? Yeah. So when I um, so I started my graduate work in 1998, and so when I uh, first started doing talks um, and going and presenting this work, I had to do a lot of you know introducing you know so uh, there's a lot of data out there. Uh, we're dealing with more and more information. Um, people are kind of dealing with you know, that there's this notion of information overload as, as a general thing, um, but we're not dealing with cell phones. Like, that it is not something that is universally felt quite as acutely as, as it is now. And so in 1998, it was very much, um, you know, there's this, uh, this data problem, um, you know, we're looking to, uh, we're just dealing with, you know, we're never gonna have less data. Um, how do we start, you know, thinking about what, uh, what to do with that? And then the solution we feel is around uh, design and visualization and how you understand it. Um, fast forward maybe you know, five, six, seven years later, so 2005 I'm out, uh, so you know, finishing my PhD and out doing talks and they're like, yeah, 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 we get it, there's a data problem, what's the solution? And so it's, well, you know, there's uh, design and visualization and um, this is a, a way of kind of humanizing what you see in these 
uh, data sets and getting people to um, think about it. And then a couple years later, uh, you know, when I started the, uh, this, the firm in 2010, we were actually at a point where large companies and clients and things like that were actually coming to us and saying, we need data visualization. You know, and so that was completely different from even five years prior, even 10 years prior, and that, um, that it was something where people were understanding, okay, now we know that we have these enormous data sets internally, and we need to start making some sense of it. And the, um, the thing that we've, that I've been trying to really focus on is this notion of, um, that's great, we have, you know, we can do all this data science work, we can make uh, sense of the data algorithm, al algorithmically, um, you know, but it's also still, uh, still too restricted to a small number of people within an organization who actually understand what's happening in the data. And I think that um, the whole thing is, how do you, how do you expand that out? You know, so instead of 10 people within an organization, I want it to be 100 or a few hundred um, who can actually look at that data, be able to make decisions based on it. Um, you know, it's only as effective as you can, you know, as far as you can communicate it within an organization. And so um, that's kind of the, um, and at the end of the day, it's, it's humans that need to understand it, right? You know, so how do you actually put a human face on this and have it relatable to people in a way that's not simply, you know, that doesn't require a statistics PhD to, you know, start, start modeling it? Follow up. Like, because uh, that's what I thought that you were referring to, but now, and here we are in 2016, and I feel really overwhelmed by the quantity of data that there is, the information overload that you referred to, and I feel like it's only going to get bigger. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like there's, there's something besides just trying to understand as much of the data that you can, which is probably just a fraction, mm -hmm. in, especially in 50 years from now. Like, there's something that feels really strange to me about having all of this information but not being able to understand what it means. Like that's a different kind of problem. That's a different kind of thing than, than not knowing something because it's, it's not knowable or it can't be scientifically proven or whatever. Mm -hmm. This is like, you know, the information's out there, we just can't figure out how to, how to handle it. It's, it's, and I wonder how people in your field talk about that that kind of disconnect. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's really, so uh, a significant part of that is where, you know, so this design aspect comes from, right? So the design is not so much the, well, you know, we pick this color, this font or something like that, but rather, what are the first couple things I see? How do I actually put some sort of hierarchy around this to get a sense of, um, you know, what's, what's happening and then be able to go in another layer and another layer and another layer. And so the reason that we feel overload is that we're, we have too many things kind of shouting at us at once, mm. and what you actually need to do is, you know, the very first thing you need to do is start putting some structure around that. And so, what what are the things that you actually need to see first, and then what are the things you need to see second, and then you know the things third. And so, it really be able to um, uncover those layers, and that the, um, you know, so that's the design 101 uh, approach to it, and um, also that that is tied to the psychology of what, you know, how much stuff that we can, you know, we can take in at a given time, uh, what people are comfortable with, what their level of attention is, what, uh, you know, it's everything from the context in which they're using it, where it's, uh, are they distracted, you know? So uh, highway signs are designed differently because we're, uh, we're driving at 60 miles an hour right. as we're trying to read them, you know? They're not necessarily designed well for that, but um, <laughs> thank God we have GPS. Uh, so, uh, but it's those, you know, those kinds of issues that we're trying to, um, trying to so use. So just trying to put some structure to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, it still seems overwhelming to me. <laughs> Our the work's not finished. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of, it's, the, the great uh, job security in this is that people are just making bigger and bigger messes. So. <laughs> yeah. Dale, you have a question? Hi, I'm a librarian, and I think librarians have a big role in this. Um, I totally agree. Organizing yeah. information. And as an educator librarian, I talked, we talk to the kids a lot about uh, not accepting the first information they find mm -hmm. online. And we have a whole evaluation page, but it's interesting listening to you because I think we have to start educating them about design science mm -hmm. as well because they'll get on a site that's glitzy and great, and, and just like you said, mm -hmm. the first red thing they see, they're gonna say, well, this is the yep. truth. So I wonder if you have any advice about mm -hmm. how to go about 
teaching them to analyze that? I think the, um, I mean, I love your point about uh, looking for different sources with it, right? You know, so how do you actually put that in context? One of the things that um, we're, uh, we're working on right now is um, uh, a piece looking at um, equal pay, you know, so the um, uh, Women's Quality Day is on, on Friday, and so this idea of, you know, so people throw out this, you know, uh, women earn 73 cents the dollar uh, when compared to men, or maybe it's 87 cents, or it's 83, you know, and so, um, you know, trying to say, well, what, what is that uh, number, and where do those different numbers come from? And so that, and the answer is, uh, well, there's a number that's based on uh, a set of U.S. statistics from the Bureau of Labor uh, Statistics, or there's another set of numbers that are from uh, OECD, which are uh, uh, more global. Um, Ivanka Trump had a version that was 94%, you know, women make 94%, which I, of course, I'd heard that. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, so I think it is important to, you know, both, uh, you know, look through those different uh, variations of it and, you know, seek out those variations, as you're saying. Um, but also, I think one of the things, another thing that I get excited about with visualization is, it, as a way of unpacking some of the subtlety of that, right? So instead of just the bumper sticker that we can say, here's the bumper sticker, but mm. here are all the things that go into that. And like, you know, so in that 87 cents number, here's the country breakdown within that. And then within the country breakdown, here's the, you know, mm. field by field breakdown of what that looks like. And so finding ways of really kind of digging through those different layers. Um, and then I think the other part is, um, you know, that critical thinking aspect of, um, getting people to think about what it, you know, what is it you're responding to in this in this thing you're looking at visually, and that um, is it because it's you know on a black background and it's a lot of thin lines with lots of transparency and it's really lovely, or is it the the content of it? Does uh, does seeing that thing actually want to you know does it make you engage further? Um, you know, because again, I want people to be engaging their critical uh, brain as opposed to just the oh that's really pretty. You know. <laughs> Thank you. It's time. Yeah. Well, that's all we have time for the questions. Oh, you have a question? OK, go ahead. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <laughs> so I'll make them quick. This yeah. is typical, right? Uh, yeah. Number one, is, what has been your these most? These are always the tough ones. No, like no. Right at the end, it's like, no, no. just this one question. Yeah. Uh, what's been your most challenging project to date? Oh, interesting. Um, I think the uh, I think the platform projects tend to be the most challenging and therefore to me most interesting. So the the no ceilings work and the China work, um, I think it uh, and also that like the degree to which to me that you know they they kind of give us a, a view into what what's possible. But man, I can you know like I'm very glass uh, half empty about you know the things that we produce that I'm like it could be this much better, you know? So the degree to which it's like, oh, we just figured out this little piece of it, um, you know, it really gets into, uh, you know, how can we engage that many more people with the no ceilings work? Um, you know, we didn't even begin, we uh, aren't reaching nearly as many people as we would like to um, with that work. Um, with the China project, um, it's a, you know, it's incredibly complicated. It was a really fascinating thing to work on, but um, it reminds me of this really great quote um, from Pascal that he um, said in a letter to a friend, you know, I'm sorry this letter is uh, so long, I didn't have time to make it shorter. <laughs> and so this, uh, you know, this idea of like, uh, you know, like we, we have, you know, everything's in there, but mm. I really want to simplify it further. Like I want it, it needs to be that like a, and we're losing people because of, you know, the level of complexity that's, mm. that's even still there, um, you know, for as much work as we had put into it. So. So it's the, the ongoing challenge of that, I think, is also what's interesting for us. And in your industry, I, I suppose you always have to look ahead at the next visual. Mm -hmm. What is the next visual? Is it virtual? Do you go there? I, I think, um, you know, so I'm a, a, it's interesting that, you know, this is the, the future theme. I'm, I'm like a terrible futurist. I first saw like a web browser in 90 something and was like, this is boring and ugly. <laughs> um, so it's a, a designer, but left, right? yeah, but and, and boy, was I wrong. Um, but the, uh, but I think the, I think the idea of uh, 
to me, the, the future is really how do we figure out how to make this, um, uh, how do we be pragmatic about how we understand information, right? So, uh, you know, data is you know moving like this in terms of the amount of stuff that's out there. Our evolution is kind of going like this. Maybe right. I should have done a little bit. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we're kind of stuck doing this, and within you know like the data science field, um, and within you know these other all these various fields that are trying to solve data problems we're kind of moving at like this speed, right? And so um, I think we need to do a drastically better job in terms of how we, uh, how we start looking at that. It's, um, and I think across, uh, and to me also it's this thing of getting off of just the screen, right? So um, uh, it's that much more interesting to get, uh, get data in ways that people, um, that it is part of their environment, right? So, uh, we often use this sort of uh, parent test for our work, you know, so could we show this to our parents and have it make sense? Could we show it to our siblings and have it make sense? Um, does conveying this idea involve saying, all right, go sit at a computer and open up this URL and, you know, uh, click through these various things and it kind of lives in within this very virtual kind of space that's not very real. Um, compare that to, boy, if we could actually make a three-dimensional sculpture of it or something like that and actually put that in an installation or, um, something like that. It has a very different, you know, uh, different sort of thing. Um, what, uh, a favorite artwork of mine, a, uh, a group in uh, in Helsinki, um, they took the uh, the power output from uh, the town's power plant and projected that. You know, so they they got a live feed of that data and projected a green cloud um, onto the. Uh, the smoke, the emissions coming off of that power plant. And so that was something where um, it's a single, you know, single data point done live, but the entire city was then able to look in the sky and see wow. this is how much we're, you know, energy we're using or producing at this given time. Huh? And crazy. then they did an event around that to say, all right, we're gonna, at this uh, time, this particular evening, we're gonna try and turn off as many devices as we possibly can in the house and in our homes and then we can all look in the sky and see how that actually affects you know, the, our energy consumption. And so uh, on some level that's a very simple idea, but that's, uh, it's so incredibly striking in terms of how you, um, that is so much more relatable than you know, uh, for each person in that town saying like, you know, energy usage is something that's really important to uh, you know, pay attention to and go to use less energy, you know, Helsinki.com and you know, um, and these people are kind of like, eh, okay, I, I care about it or don't. Um, but, you know, that cloud up in the sky is, is unmistakable. And so, um, again, just how do you bring this kind of thing to different, uh, different kinds of audiences is really important. So. Wow, that sounds really awesome. Okay, well, let's thank uh, Ben again.